Can you tell us something about your, what you know about what you call the secret team? Um, who are the secret team? Whether there are people still around today that you knew in the 60s? Um, and mm. what kind of activities they were involved in? Well, uh, you mentioned the secret team, and it's a rather popular term since it's been uh, popularized by, uh, by Ollie North and, and Secord and the rest of them. Uh, actually, the book I wrote called The Secret Team is autobiographical. It explains my nine years' work in the Pentagon in this kind of business. Uh, actually, I had been in, in uh, intelligence-type work long before I came to the Pentagon. I was at the Cairo Conference in 1943 and the Tehran Conference in 1943 when there were some uh, uh, very important uh, secret operations carried out. I was in the Soviet Union in 1944 and in Turkey in 1944. So that through all this period, beginning way back in the 40s, it was clear that even though I was working close to men like Winston Churchill, I lived right across the street from him once when he was in Marrakech and so on, you, you would see that they would be carrying out some kind of instructions. Uh, I think most of us don't realize that Chiang Kai-shek was at Tehran. No one was ever told that. It's never been in the news. I can show you where it is in certain research books now. That was a covert operation. Why did they bring him there? Under whose direction was such as that done? You ask yourself those questions when you see these people working. I've worked in a room like this with Alan Dulles, right at home with him, with John Foster Dulles right there, and listened to the two of them talking about how we're going to do this or how we're going to do that. And then I've seen John, John Foster Dulles pick up the telephone and call somebody overseas. And you realize they're taking an input, taking instructions. They're not the top men. So that in my own work, and I know I'm not the only one that writes this, uh, Buckminster Fuller has written this kind of thing. Even Churchill's book contained this kind of work. There is a high cabal, the words that Churchill used, that, uh, that runs things. Now, we'll never describe those people. Their greatest strength is their anonymity, and they know that. Now, at lower levels, there are secret teams in the sense that, that governments or uh, parts of governments don't stop them. Uh, as we see through this whole Iran hostage exchange thing. The Germans were involved, the Israelis were involved, the Swiss were involved, the Swedish were involved, Otto Palma was involved, the British were involved, all around the world, the South Koreans were involved. Well, what kind of a team is there that can be assembled to do a job like the hostage exchange and selling arms to Iran and so on and so on? That's not any part of one government, but it's a most effective organization. And in many ways, that organization worked under, um, well, nominally, uh, Ali North, but the people at North was working for. So the closer you get to this type of operation, and the more years you spend in this kind of operation, you recognize that there is a secret team that even governmental structures does not encompass. It's a very powerful, large organization. The people at the top are faceless. We will never know them. And I, I don't put people like Ronald Reagan or Winston Churchill or Franklin Roosevelt at the top. They're people above them. What about LBJ? Would you put him in that category? Certainly not. Yeah, no, Lyndon Johnson was a, one of the finest members of the Senate that we ever had as being effective, effective member of the U.S. Senate. But if you work closely with senators, you will find out they're taking orders from people all the time and I have worked very closely with them. In fact, one of my jobs while I was in the Pentagon for these nine years was to be the military emissary to certain key senators where I would walk in their office and say, General so-and-so has asked me to tell you that we are going to do this kind of a program. Senator would talk about it a little bit, and thank you very much, and go back. Now, the senator was accepting what we told him, not the other way around, you see. Uh, Lyndon Johnson became president uh, after Kennedy's murder. He'd been a rather effective vice president. But if you look carefully at his tenure in office, I think you'll find out that it had certain ups and downs, especially in that speech when he said he was not going to run again for president and all, where you have a feeling of somebody has just told that man what to do when he's doing it. You see, if you think seriously about this business of assassination, it's stereotyped, isn't it? Kennedy assassinated by a lone nut. Bobby Kennedy assassinated. James Earl Ray is a 
lone nut killing Martin Luther King and so on. Let's go one step ahead into this, the professional part of assassinations because you can see right away this other story breaks down. When it was the objective of this government to assassinate Castro, the Bay of Pigs failed miserably because it was an over the beach landing and we got involved with that and that was a fail. So they created an organization called Mongoose. Mongoose was the uh, cover word for it. Now the objective of the Mongoose program uh, for those people who understood it, was to assassinate Castro by any means. And as we found out later during hearings in the 70s, uh, we even used uh, mafia hitmen, skilled mechanics, skilled killers. Uh, we used uh, poisoned things. We used all kinds of... There's a lady that used to be a friend of Castro's, I think, that said she was being sent back there to, to feed him some pills or something that would kill him, and on and on and on, all kinds of things. But Here's what we need to get from the format of that story is that Mongoose is an organization created by the United States government to commit assassinations. Never mind Castro. It was created for assassinations. Now these people are selected, trained, equipped for that purpose, to get in there and shoot somebody and get out. And the getting out part is the hard part. That's where they need the rest of the organization. The hitmen are probably four or five experienced people that can do the job from any angle with any weapon and do it right. But to get them out of there and what the patterns are and how you're going to do it is a very intricate thing. So you have to have a trained program. And in this case, we called it Mongoose. Now, there's no reason to believe that Mongoose ended when somebody decided that, well, we're not going to kill Castro this year, we'll let it go. But Mongoose is an assassination incorporated organization. Uh, I've seen it used in foreign countries with the same men, the same people. And these are not all Americans. They're people who are uh, mercenaries. They're people who have reasons, they think, for being in this kind of program. Uh, they live that life. They have families they're taken care of, and this is their business. And to think that it's put together for one assassination or for another assassination is not an understanding of the program. It, it's a permanent part of things. It's uh, unfortunate that it is, but it is. It's a permanent part of things and very carefully programmed and very carefully supported. Just consider, Kennedy was killed in 1963. I don't know a single newspaper in the United States that will print the words that Kennedy was killed by anyone other than Oswald. There's still a control. Well, a mongoose-type professional organization sees to it that the conditioning of even newspapers persists. Or another way to say it is that the pressures on the newspapers persist. Mongoose is a real strong program. Now, I'm overworking one code name, but you see what I mean. It's what Lyndon Johnson called Murder Incorporated, and it's a continuing operation. You see, when the CIA came into being in the U.S. government in 1947, it really had no antecedent other than the FBI. And the FBI had had limited experience in foreign countries, but it had quite a bit uh, considering what the CIA had. So it was very early realized that the two would have to support each other. So there's an office called the Office of Security in CIA, which really is made up of FBI people. It was founded by a very famous CIA man, Chef Edwards, Sheffield Edwards, but he was really a career FBI man. One of the better known names of the Watergate era, Jim McCord, was in that office of security, but he really was an FBI man and Bob Bannerman and so on. They were FBI people. So when you run into data that says the FBI did this or the CIA did that, uh, you have to be very careful or you have to investigate a little further because what it really is probably is the overlap of the two. Uh, they work very closely together, not the way a lot of people think where one thinks the other one is on his turf and there's some, some disagreements. There are disagreements, but they're not important. They really work very closely together. And if you run into a program where they say uh, some people were trained by FBI experts, the chances are pretty good they were trained by CIA experts or even vice versa. They work very closely together. J. Richard Kennedy reported to the CIA um, that Martin Luther King was engaged in communistic type activities. Mm -hmm. uh, he reported to them on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I believe that he uh, reported to the Office of Security, in fact. Mm -hmm. 
Is, would that be significant that he reported to that office? Well, certainly, because, see, the Office of Security, and I'm talking about the CIA Office of Security, uh, was, was founded and headed by Chef Edwards, who was an FBI man. Mr. Dulles knew that the FBI was on the periphery of, of CIA and, and worked accordingly, as did J. Edgar Hoover. And uh, many of the programs that were most important within the CIA's jurisdiction <clears throat> received an awful lot of support from FBI people. And uh, this was always done through this central office, the central office, the Office of Security. It's an important group of people. Can you just tell us what you know about the CIA's use of hypnosis in manipulating operatives? Well, you know, the, the business of hypnosis is interesting, especially uh, when I'm talking among British friends, because we have to go to you for the beginning of that. You may recall in your own history that Lord Oliphant, when he was the uh, king's ambassador to the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople, came back with hypnosis to Great Britain. And this started the British Society of Psychic Research, which immediately spread into the United States. And hypnosis has been a very active program among certain areas uh, through seances, through the use of chemicals, and all that sort of thing. It's not uh, limited to intelligence operations, and uh, it's an old tool. That, uh, mind control is really what we call it today, and every effort possible is going into the mind control business. And the CIA is very active in that. Uh, our MK Ultra program was uh, pressing the limits of mind control, uh, but that's a major international program. To your knowledge, has it ever included hypnotizing assassins who would then carry out the job without really knowing what they were doing and be programmed to do that? Well, as you know, hypnosis is used uh, uh, to make people do a lot of things. And the business of mind control with respect to uh, uh, conditioning assassins and conditioning people to other things uh, is universal. We all know that. And there's no... Um, the action of these people who are involved uh, in assassinations, everything from uh, Hinckley to, to uh, James Earl Ray, we'll say, and others like that, Sirhan and all these people, are not normal. Something odd happened to them because, first of all, uh, uh, 20 years, 12, 25 years have passed, and some of these people are still in this state that is not exactly normal. I think they were submitted to uh, pretty heavy doses of certain kind of drugs or medicines, and probably to hypnosis and other devices for mind control. It's a very advanced art. Uh, there were a couple of cases where uh, the police activity was disrupted. In one case, there was a hoax radio broadcast immediately after the killing. Mm -hmm. And secondly, a, d a detective was removed from a surveillance post due to apparent threat to his life, which completely diverted a lot of attention. Would you like to comment on what I just said? Mm -hmm. You see, um, <clears throat> this business of preparing police for this kind of operation, some of the things that, that uh, happen are brought about by certain training programs. Now, in about 1960 or 61, uh, this country began to support what was called the Inter-American Police Academy in Panama. Now, uh, it's a very benevolent sounding organization. We were going to train the police establishments of Latin American countries. But what is done also is a certain amount of overkill. Instead of bringing in, say, 20 instructors to train all this group, we bring in maybe 120. And then we have training for the instructors. We're not supposed to train the American police. We don't have a national police. We have local police, and we're not supposed to have federal programs to train the police. But by bringing in, let's say, five times or six times more instructors than we need, we train the instructors, they go back home. Therefore, there are key people in police departments who are aware of certain connections, who are aware of certain programs, and then are amenable to accepting calls that other police might not know what to do with, and this prepares them for such things as happen in Dallas or Los Angeles or Memphis, because even then they think, well, we're just carrying out something that the federal government asked us to do, and it isn't until the next day that they learn that it was following uh, uh, an assassination, and then, of course, on their own behalf to keep quiet also, because they didn't do their job. They'd have to be asked, why didn't you do their job? 
So the police role here is a very difficult one, but you can see how finely it's operated and how effective that becomes. Because after the murder is a very hard time to come back and protect somebody. It's easy to protect them before the murder. Can I run something else past you, Fletcher, and get your response to it? Uh, Eric Gold, who was the, um, the man that James L. Ray obtained the identity of and used, he worked um, on a secret defense project for Union Carbide, um, and he had an intelligence file at Union Carbide. <coughs> There's also one developed by the, the RCMP. Now, he's of the opinion that Ray knew so much about him that he could only have got that information from his intelligence file, Galt's intelligence file. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you respond to that and, and tell us, were the ways in which the RCMP related to the American defense American intelligence or defense networks, and are the ways in which one can obtain an intelligence file from a top secret defense project like that. Mm -hmm. when, when you speak of intelligence files, you, you want to think carefully that intelligence is a very broad term within any government, and that the intelligence agency involved, whether it is an FBI or a CIA or a DISC, are, are Defense Department intelligence organization that protects our manufacturing facilities and all that. It's a very strong organization, too. Well, now, there are files in every country, uh, company that we have defense contracts with. Very, very elaborate files, because they want to know who they're dealing with. Now, those are intelligence files, and they're available. Now, because so much of American business is done hand-in-glove with Canadian firms, an enormous amount of business, this kind of intelligence carries over between the two countries, and I believe, this I'm not 100% sure of, although I've worked with many of these people, that the uh, Royal Canadian Mounties are the ones that are the counterpart in Canada. I say I believe that because I met with them, but I'm not real positive. But it is easy for them to coordinate files one with the other. Now, if there was an operation to be laid on in which it was important that they know the files of a certain individual, whether he was in Canada or the United States or both. Sure, they can have access to the files. I myself have had access to Canadian and Australian and British material that those countries considered secret, top secret and all, and in exchange we provided our material. So if you were going to fabricate a record for somebody or use somebody else's record as a cover, that could be done even though it involved two countries or three countries. Can I pass something else in front of you. Um, in your experience, is it conceivable that a CIA man or an intelligence, a U.S. intelligence man could have been operating in Montreal supplying identities, packages of identities, for covert operations? Um, again, we're back to the same point, that the area in which an organization like CIA operates is, is international, and it is uh, in real time. You know, it's, it's a going business. Uh, I know that in 1955, when I first went into the Pentagon and began this work in the intelligence area, that the office I was in, not the section I worked in, but we sat in the same room, uh, had uh, a number of programs that were current with Canada at that time, uh, one involving a man that I've heard a lot of, of since then called Ewan Cameron. Well, Cameron was a psychiatrist, I believe, but the programs he was running were very advanced, very much into mind control, psychological warfare type things, brainwashing, that was the term in those days. Well, now, the work that he was doing was funded ostensibly by the United States Air Force, but, but actually by the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, the, the data passing back and forth between his organization and others uh, was like a blanket. It would cover any area that you wanted. So certainly these things exist and exist in an international atmosphere and are available uh, to all units involved. And I know that in that case, Montreal was the scene of Ewan Cameron's work. There's no question about that. Okay, thank you very much, Fred. I was looking through the peephole of the glass as I was watching Dr. King, I saw him look over toward the boarding house. And then whenever he looked back, like he was going to look into the parking area, that's when he come up off of the grating, and that's when he was shot. I felt very bad inside that this had to happen 
in Memphis, Tennessee. The weight of world condemnation came down on the city of Memphis on the 4th of April, 1968. This was the killing of a major world figure. How could they have allowed it to happen? There were even suspicions that the Memphis authorities were accessories to the murder and involved in a cover-up. The man convicted of King's murder, James Earl Ray, still protests his innocence. In this film, we show new evidence that there was indeed a conspiracy and that the trail leads into the heart of government itself. Thank you.